Give me right up the back. Fantastic. Uh, welcome to our second last session of the 2018 Feminist Writers Festival in Sydney. Our festival is being held on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners and to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to the elders from any other communities who may be with us today. Uh, my name's Christy Clark. I'm founder of the Feminist Writers Festival. And thank you so much for coming along this afternoon to our session, Resist Words for the Feminist Activist. Before we get started, please double check that your phones are turned on to silent. Really do double check. <laughs> um, but please do keep it on because we'd love to hear from you. And so join in the conversation on Twitter or Facebook using the hashtag FWF18. Uh, please be aware that we are recording this session for live streaming and for uh, podcasting and that any questions or comments, but I would prefer questions, please, <laughs> that you make at the end um, will be recorded as part of that. This year we decided to focus our festival program explicitly on a number of issues and one of those was activism because it felt necessary. Feminists have always had to fight for the cause but just now the path feels particularly steep and the risk of going backwards again <laughs> looms ever larger on the horizon. So we need to use every available tool in our arsenal, especially including the written word. Each of our amazing panellists today has used the written word, amongst other things, to engage in feminist activism and advocacy, and I'm delighted to introduce them to you today. Next to me, I have a panellist who needs little introduction, particularly to a room full of feminists. Uh, Eva Cox is a long-term feminist activist, sociologist and political stirrer who's committed to making societies more civil. As an early refugee from Hitler, she wants to stop such horrors. She became a feminist age three when denied access to a drum. Because <laughs> they were only for boys. <laughs> one could argue you've been... <laughs> one could argue you've been beating one ever since. <laughs> Her feminism is based on fixing gender inequity and power imbalances, not just on equality with men on their terms which seems like a poor agenda. <laughs> um, at the far end, I have Winnie Dunn, a Tongan Australian writer and community arts worker from Mount Druitt. She's the manager of Sweatshop, Western Sydney Literacy Movement, and the literary editor of The Big Black Thing and Bent Not Broken, 10 years of creative writing from the city of Can Canterbury, ba Bankstown. Winnie's essays and short stories have been published in The Lifted Brow, Sydney Review of Books, Nianjin, The Griffith Review and SBS Life. Next to Eva, uh, we have a bit of a hero of mine, Christine Milne Ayo, who's a feminist, a lifelong environmental and social justice campaigner and a grandmother. Just poor paragraph planning there. <laughs> She was the first woman to, leave a political party in to lead a political party in Tasmania and was part of the formation and evolution of Greens politics in Australia and around the world. Addressing global warming is her passion. Finally, our fourth panellist is Dr Shailene Robinson. Shailene has published many books on LGBTIQ history and other topics. She's a historian and the director of Australian Marriage Equality and served as New South Wales co-convener since 2012. She's also president of Sydney's Pride History Group. And in 2017, the conversation named Shirlene as one of Australia's top 50 thinkers. Could you please join me in welcoming our panel? <laughs> so I'm gonna direct my first question to everyone on the panel. And what I'd really like to hear from you is how you define your activism and what does feminist activism mean to you? Maybe I'll start with you, Eva. Well, I'm one of these people that's known as a 70s feminist, so you have to put up with the fact that I come from a very long history, apart from the kindergarten teacher in the 1940s, uh, of trying to make changes. Because I grew up partly as a sort of a refugee child, I had a lot of questions about what I was doing in England as a refugee from Hitler at a very early age. And it set me up to question a lot of things about society, but I did really object to being told I couldn't do things 
because I was a girl, which is why the drum thing was so significant for me. But for me, feminist activism, and I became very much involved in it in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, is about changing the world. I keep threatening to rerun a badge that we had in the 1970s, which said women who want equality with men lack ambition. <laughs> because basically what's happened, I think, in the last 20 to 30 years is we've fallen into that trap. We are now trying to be, in Simon de Beauvoir's terms, the second sex, we're still the second sex, because our ambitions are to behave like men and change things a little bit around the fringes. I think the women's movement generally has lost its way in these sorts of things because we're not trying to change what's wrong with society. We're trying to make our way up through the system or we're pre prepared to be critics of what's going wrong. But the image of what a feminist or feminist-run society's feminist recreation of society is, we haven't got to yet, and I'm still trying to do it, and it's about time the rest of you took over because I'm getting pretty old. So that makes sense. <laughs> Christine, how about for you? Uh, well, thank you, and um, thanks for coming this afternoon. So I've been uh, a woman in politics for a long time, a woman in uh, environment movement and in social justice, peace and non-violence. And so for me, it's about addressing justice and, and it's not just about standing up to what's going on that's wrong, but actually changing it. So that's where I come to the same conclusion as Eva. It's actually about driving change. And that's one of the issues I've had with some of the, in the environment movement as well. And if you think about the Occupy movement, it was fantastic for raising awareness of what is wrong with neoliberalism, what is wrong with capitalism, but it failed in the end because it didn't actually have a systemic, an agenda for systemic change to be taken through the political processes, through the decision-making processes, and actually bring about that change. So I regard myself as a feminist activist in the justice area, it's social justice, eco um, environmental justice, uh, economic justice, about participation. So it's about driving change and that's the difference between a feminist activist and a female activist necessarily because if you get women in positions of power, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're activists for change. They can actually be defenders of the status quo. So I put myself in the category of the ones driving change. Charlene, how about you? Uh, yeah, I think uh, to understand, I guess, the way that I uh, came to, uh, uh, and very much relating to, to what we've just heard from Christine, uh, I guess I, I'd like to think a, a female a feminist activist is that I grew up in uh, Brisbane during the Joe Bjorki Peterson years, which probably uh, gives you a bit of context. So uh, it was a time when uh, a lot of civil liberties for a lot of groups were were denied. So certainly, uh, I think you can't help but be shaped by the environment in which you grow up. And um, I, had, I had a mother who immigrated to Australia from Fiji. Uh, so issues like um, uh, justice, uh, economic justice, racism, all these sort of uh, topics were really part, I think, of the environment that I grew up in. And I went to university and I was very lucky to um, study and work with a lot of women who had been involved in that pushback, I think, against the Joe Bjorki peterson uh, years. For example, my uh, PhD was supervised by Kay Saunders, who had actually been jailed for protesting during the Bjorki peterson years. So there's a wonderful photo of her, actually, which was taken in a prison cell. Um, and also, you know, there were uh, magnificent advocates for Indigenous rights, people like Jackie Huggins as well. So it was a very dynamic uh, environment to be exposed to all these ideas. So uh, I think that all those sort of uh, background factors have really shaped the way that I would conceive the role of the feminist activist and really to just uh, reiterate and, and say that I do agree that I think our role is to push things forward and not just to prop up the status quo. Winnie, how about you? It's on. Is it on? <laughs> Great. Usually I have to turn it up. <laughs> um, yeah, so I identify as an activist and I think uh, I think just by simply observing the panel here today, I'm one of the uh, only darker skinned women on this panel today. And I'm probably the only uh, Pacifica person at this festival today. Um, and so if by simply looking at the inequality that's represented here today, represented in our festival, it's a pretty clear representation of what's happening outside. Um, so I think it would 
uh, I think it's best to say that I define myself as a person who is actively dedicated to creating equal opportunities for brown and black people. Uh, a, a lot of the women on this panel were talking about creating change. Um, that's definitely true in the work that I do, um, but it, it is uh, very simply put that black and brown people are still fighting for equality uh, and that's been going on for a very long time and so I'm a very big activist um, for uh, the civil rights of black and brown people in this country uh, and in the world. Thank you. Eva, before we um, had the session today, we had a bit of a discussion about the use of the word resist uh, <laughs> in the title. Do you want to briefly describe your concerns about the word resist? So I, I sent in an email saying I wasn't prepared to come here and tell you how to resist. We were doing too much resistance at the moment. Having a demo and having a complaint about what's, a complaint about what's going on, you know, objecting to what's happening is fine. And you catch up with your friends and you have a nice warm feeling. But it's what I call orgasmic politics. You go home afterwards and feel a sort of sigh of relief, but you don't actually go out and do anything to follow it up. Or you might go to another demonstration. We actually need to produce solutions. And sort of picking up on what Winnie's point is, we need to put up things about how do we in expand things, how do we include things, how do we do it. Otherwise, we end up bickering around the edges of things rather than actually looking, A, what we have in common, and B, what the differences are and how we accommodate them. But I don't see people out there actually putting up for serious alternatives rather than complaining about what is. So I suppose what I'm saying is that I just think resistance is boring. I mean, it's quite nice and it's good fun and all the rest, but it does not change things. I used to teach advocacy and policy in this place some years ago. And what I used to tell my students was, if you're trying to create change and you're banging your head against a brick wall, learn to find out where the loose bricks are because then you go and knock them down and then the wall falls down. But if you're just standing on the outside shouting slogans or even painting them on the wall, it's not going to make the difference. We need to work out how we do it, where we do it, where we do it legally, where we do it illegally, how we do it. But we've got to get out there and do things. At the moment, we're doing a lot of good work supporting the victims of things like Me Too and the victims of domestic violence, but we're not changing a culture that creates them. We're not actually taking a look at what we're doing that creates the sort of problems that we're getting. We're complaining about the outcomes and the outputs rather than getting back into what we do in socialization, what we do outside the fucking economy. I've got the slogan saying that we are actually not, you know, that we are citizens who live in a society. We are not customers that live in an economy but the entire sort of political system seems to be geared to talking about the economy, which leaves out almost everything to do with the social, which means all types of feminists get excluded because we are the ones that gets, get the social left to us, undervalued and, under, uh, uh, and ignored. And if we're serious about it, we have to put the cultural and the social back on the agenda because it covers the things about the black, the brown, Aboriginal change, all of those things there, which are cultural issues, not economics on a 17th century, 19th century, whatever it is, Northern European male version of the importance of paid work. We've got to start actually challenging some of those assumptions and start looking at what a good society looks like and get move towards it. And paid work has its job, uh, it has its place. Economics is a useful way of adding up the money. But it's not something that you should be running us by, and we've got to sort of actually look at it. It's deeply, basically sexist, because it only deals with those things that get counted in trade and trading and exchange. It doesn't do anything for the stuff we do unpaid. It doesn't do anything for the stuff we do about, you know, sort of the maintenance of things when we actually grow our own foods and do our own stuff. So in the time of very serious change, when the Industrial Revolution is finally tapering out, we're not getting any particular leadership from the male side of the left we're getting far too much leadership from the male side of the right. So where are we? Let's get the you know, radical feminist view, a really radical feminist view, and start working out where, what sort of world we want to live in and work together to make sure it is inclusive, but it also reflects the feminist of side of what's important in society, which is the stuff that really matters, which is our relationships, who we are, our identities, our cultures, our connections, all of those things that don't turn up in GDP. Christine, you mentioned Occupy as being a sort of an example of the, this resistance not getting us very far. But um, a lot of the people involved in, in Occupy, for example, had a particular scepticism, for example, around sort of 
a, a preformed programmatic change agenda that they thought that they needed to find a, pro, a new process of, of doing that. I mean, what do you think are some of the challenges of people coming together to agree on that agenda for the, the change? You know, I mean, y you would have some pretty <laughs> intimate um, experiences <laughs> that, 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 that that negotiation process isn't straightforward. No, the negotiation process isn't straightforward and it's absolutely true that, you, you know, it's easy to get a lot of people together to say, this is really bad, we can't stand this, this has got to change and as Eva says, everyone feels good about that and goes home. But when you ask the question, well, what do you actually want me to do about it? What are your proposals on the table now? And I want to emphasise that particularly before I go to the difficulties of it, because civil society really matters in this. And I can tell you, having been in politics for 25 years in recent years, civil society has been increasingly cut out of the policy formulation process uh, in political parties, but also in the bureaucracy in particular. And now that we've gone to... Um, the senior executive service, which is now a ministerial service, not a public service, it basically second guesses the minister on, gives them policy that the minister, they know the minister will sign off on and so on. Then what civil society wants as change is not actually being heard. Now, it might be heard in academia, but even if it is heard in academia, well, you know, it may be heard in academia, but even if it is, the people are afraid to speak out because they too, academics, are also on contracts and they are increasingly threatened with their contracts if they speak out. So there's been this press, pressing down of civil society getting out there saying this particular thing has to change. The second thing is you have to be specific. It is not enough to just go out and say this inequality has to change or this unfairness is you know, wrong or whatever. Well, which bit and how and what do you propose should change? Because I can tell you, as someone who was in politics, I was keen to hear that from people. They'd come and lobby me and I'd say, well, what do you want done about it? Specifically, what do you want me to do about it? Which questions do you want me to ask? What information do I need to put in as a question on notice? I need to know the specifics because it's unrealistic to expect people in politics to be not down to the detail on a particular area. If you've got expertise in it, then you can use it. In terms of bringing people together, this is very, very difficult, especially now in the non-government sector in Australia, where as a result of the pressure that's been brought to bear over a long time on advocacy and because of gag clauses that go to a number of these organisations where they're not allowed to speak out or they lose their government funding, what has happened is fundraising has now become front and centre of the NGO movement in Australia. Rather than policy development to bring about change, raising money to uh, maintain their organisation has become the front running thing. And that's why they don't share information or be collegiate and collaborative in terms of preparing an agenda because that means you share the information, that means your organisation can't fundraise as well as this organisation if you're both competing in the same social justice or environment or peace or, you know, um, family violence area, what, whatever it is, housing, you know, it doesn't matter. So they are uh, structural issues that have been brought about because of that and, and we really need to change that and get some sense of, okay, this needs to change, specifically what are we going to collectively agree on that we're going to bring about that change and get and campaign on it. Because ultimately we still, I would say, we live in a plutocracy rather than a democracy now, but in order to get the democracy back, you have to have civil society uh, not only protesting, but demanding specific change. So that's where I'd be coming Thank from. Thank you. Shalene, is that one of the reasons that marriage equality did gain its steam in some levels, because it was such a specific ask? I don't know. I think that um, a lot of people sort of look at um, the achievement of marriage equality, I guess, as quite a recent phenomenon, but I do think that you do have to draw back on the, the huge history that came before that. So obviously... Um, the, the organisation I worked with was founded in 2004 by actually Rodney Cribb from Tasmania uh, and uh, you know that, that in itself drew on 
uh, a lot of de you know decades of work that have been done by other activists. So I think that they're you know that yes, the the postal survey period did see a lot of people galvanised, and I, I was really lifted up and inspired. I think by a lot of the young people, and particularly young women, who really came forward and and got energised and motivated by that particular period. Uh, people didn't want it to happen, but certainly when they thought they could help, they really came forward in uh, huge numbers. And it really was, I think, quite an intersectional movement as well. But uh, yes, it did, did have that, that longer history behind it, and I think that that's so. Certainly, um, single issues, uh, I take your point that sometimes it can be easy when you do have that one ask, but actually you'd think it would have been a lot easier to achieve given that this was something that it really did just take a, you know, to, uh, going through the House of Reps, going through the Senate and changing a few words in a law. Uh, it certainly didn't take John Howard very long to change it initially, so um, the idea that it took another 13 years was a bit ridiculous. Um, so I think that's a, a complex question and um, the involvement, I guess, though, of a lot of people um, over a long period of time in whatever ways that they could help and young people throughout the, in the entire period really is something that does give me hope for progressive social change in a world where sometimes it is very easy to feel as though people can't make a difference. I do look at what was done in that period when politicians did fail uh, and the way that pe people drove change and I think that's really inspiring. Thank you. Winnie, what would you say is feminist about your activism and your writing? Um, I, well, I just want to say that I'm an intersectional feminist. I'm not simply a very broad monocultural uh, use of the word feminism. Uh, feminism definitely was not created for the equality of brown and black women uh, because uh, we just weren't considered people. And so I'm definitely an intersectional feminist to the point uh, where I think if we want to look at a holistic and more uh, realistic change about the world, it's about looking at the intersections of race, class, gender, sexuality uh, and ability. Uh, and I also think that I'm very much about the self-determination um, of black and brown people uh, to the point where um, I just don't think it it's uh, right for, for me as a marginalised person to have to ask uh, a white person in power how they need to fix the problem um, of, of my inequality. Um, that's for me to do, that's for people in my community to do, and that's for us to be at the forefront of that social change. Uh, very much so, um, people in power are not going to change the systemic issue of racism, sexism and classism in this country. Um, so what does that change look like in my own writing? Firstly, uh, there's no uh, Pacifica Australian literature and there's no Tongan Australian literature. So as a Tongan Australian writer, uh, I find it very concerning uh, that the only representation of Tongan Australians is Chris Lilly, who is a white man in blackface who portrays very racist, sexist, homophobic representations of what it means to be a Pacifica person in this country. Um, and I also found that uh, the people who had uplifted Chris Lilly's career uh, were, were very much um, br uh, white men and women um, who thought that his humour was funny and didn't necessarily have a true effect on what it meant uh, for a Pacifica to live um, to live in this society where Chris Lilly uh, could be paid thousands of dollars to enact racism. <coughs> and so that's part of my own goal in my own writing, to be very specific about what it means to be a mixed race Tongan Australian woman who grew up in Western Sydney in Mount Jewett, which is a, which is a specifically low socioeconomic area. If you've ever heard of the uh, documentary series Struggle Street, um, that's how uh, very uh, rich uh, <laughs> white people see the place where I live. It's, it's called, um, it's called, it's called, I think it's called like, class porn or something where 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 rich white people kind of get off poverty on what porn. it means yeah poverty porn of what it means um to grow up uh in a low socioeconomic threshold um as a brown person and so my work at sweatshop western sydney literacy movement is about being exclusive so we've literally set up spaces where it's simply for indigenous and culturally and linguistically diverse writers to come together in a safe space to reclaim and represent their own narratives um, and so I do have problems with the words occupation um, simply because this country is an occupied country um, and it has ignored the rights of Indigenous sovereignty um, for, for over 200 years. 
And so my work at Sweatshop is about producing uh, written works by marginalised people who represent their own stories. And so The Big Black Thing, Chapter 1, The Big Black Thing, Chapter 2, and Bet Not Broken are Sweatshop publications, um, which showcase this uh, change and this kind of self-determined uh, affirmative action. So if anybody is interested in buying those books and seeing what it actually means for marginalised uh, brown and black people to represent themselves, I think it's on sale at Glebe on the bottom floor. Yeah, the bookseller is putting up her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Christine, given your long involvement in environmental activism, I'm wondering if you could tell us your thoughts on how to best integrate a feminist perspective into other activist spaces and perhaps of, of whether there are challenges. Can I just briefly, before you go into that, yeah. one of the things that just listening... Just bring that mic behind Sorry, us. one of the things that just listening to that really brought forward to me is the fact that I think there's two factors that we don't actually talk about often enough. One is the concept of trust. And at the moment what we have is a huge distrust thing where we distrust government, we distrust institutions, with good reason. And particularly, you know, if you talk about Winnie stuff and so on, you know, there's no reason to trust them. But distrust is actually quite a destructive feeling if it gets too strong because then you actually get it feeds into the populist stuff. The populist stuff is very much based on mass distrusts. And I think we've got to actually have some understanding of the fact that we need two things, I think, if we're going to work on these sort of things. One is an understanding of what trust might mean between people and the development of it. And at the moment, there's not a lot of that between the various groups. And the other one is optimism. And I think that's the big one missing. If you go back to the 1970s, 60s, 70s, post-war period, there was some pretty crappy stuff that was going on, but we actually believed we could fix it, and we did. We fixed a lot of it. We didn't fix all of it. We left an awful lot undone, and that's what the problem is. But at the moment, I think people are pessimistic, and that's one of the reasons why we, I come up to sort of saying solutions, because we need to think the change is possible. But the other thing we need to do, and I keep quoting this quote of Oscar Wilde's because it does appeal to me in the sense where he says, Utopia is the, uh, the next island to the one you've just landed on. I think we expect to find an, a, a long-term solution and an output thing, and that's where we get into the sorts of arguments that destroy things like Occupy, because they want to have everything specified out. What we need to do is to try and find ways of working together with a sense of optimism, with an understanding that we don't have the answers, but we do have a sense of direction about where we're going to go. And that gets back to issues around self-determination, gets back to all of those sorts of issues we're raising. And we need to find ways of working around that so that we do actually create both a mixture of trust, at least of each other, and optimism. Otherwise, basically, we're fucked, to put it elegantly. So, <laughs> so speaking of things. Yeah, so that's why I just wanted, before we sort of started talking about... In, in the environment. <laughs> okay, so, so back to um, the environment, feminism and the environment movement. So I'll just go back a step or two. Um, basically, I was lucky in the, the time that uh, in my youth when I first became involved in environmentalism and then in politics in a sense because there was an incre increasing awareness in the 70s that the same uh, mentality of dominate and destroy the earth was very much the same mentality that dominated and destroyed women, that was the same mentality that saw mega investment in nuclear arms and the Cold War, the arms race and so on. It was all coming from the same patriarchal mentality, if you like, to dominate the earth, to dominate women, to dominate first peoples, to dominate um, uh, across the spectrum. So the people who came together, in the green movement and the, uh, particularly the, the four principles on which it's, ba it's based are um, environmental justice or ecology, social justice, participatory democracy and peace and non-violence which actually went to addressing uh, the issues and the uh, appealing to the people who were leading advocates in those fields and they're all fighting the same mentality at one level. And so uh, that has been something I've been um, fortunate to be part of and that's why you'll find in green politics around the world there are way more women than men uh, because that it, it has been a politics which has seen um, women be able to be pre-selected, 
um, the participatory democracy, the consensus decision making, which drives a lot of people mad, me, me too, in <laughs> some of the time. Um, but nevertheless, it, in a, it forces the issue of people coming together, forces the issue of trying to reach a consensus as opposed to majority votes and so on and so forth. So feminism is built into an awareness that you are fighting the same fights uh, and also you've got the issue that the reality is that that has led to poor people being the subject of the greatest amount of pollution, the greatest amount of exploitation. If you have a look now at global warming, of course the people who are most impacted immediately are our colleagues and friends in the Pacific Islands and the, the most vulnerable countries around the world are the poorest people, are the least responsible for the problem that they are now facing. And of course, First Peoples, whether it's the Penan people, wherever they are, they are the people who have been driven out of their forests, off their lands by the gas companies, the logging companies, the exploitative, the fisheries, you know, whatever it is, it's the, the fact is we have exploitative uh, attitude towards the natural environment, the earth, our home, and that's where it's come from. So I have been lucky in the sense of being involved in a movement which has had at its heart that idea of taking on that exploitative mentality which is a patriarchal one. Having said that, the environment movement, just like um, other movements have been in my in my view affected by neoliberalism in terms of the structure of the organizations and so you are seeing a lot more bureaucracy a lot of top-down um, uh, management um, modes I suppose uh, yeah just modes of organization which have come a long way, f uh, have moved a long way from the original forms of organisation of the movement. And I think uh, whilst it was important that, that um, NGOs stopped exploiting all their volunteers <laughs> and so on, um, and we did professionalise at one level, I think it's gone too far in terms of that, and we need to go back and think more carefully about inclusion and about in vol encouraging volunteerism, appreciating volunteerism, and, uh, and one of the great things, and Eva is an advocate for universal basic income, and so am I. And one of the fundamental shifts we could make in terms of a feminist perspective to encourage volunteerism and greater activity in civil society is to give everybody a universal basic income to enable people in society to participate in the ways they'd like to. Thank you. Charlene, has a feminist perspective always been a given in the marriage equality campaign? Uh, I think I would answer that in two parts and say that I've been fortunate to work with, uh, I think, particularly um, three, three leaders who have all appreciated the importance of putting forward different viewpoints. So um, that Rodney Croom, Alex Greenwich and uh, Tim Gartrell at various stages. But I would also say that a lot of women uh, well, there's, there's a few issues there. So obviously the goal of marriage itself, there's been a journey. So in the time that I've been in the marriage equality movement, there have been a lot of women who have not, um, you know, they haven't seen marriage perhaps as a goal that is worthy um, of, of sort of fighting for. So that, that's something that I have seen change. And I certainly, I would not want, and I hope no one tweets this, but I wouldn't want to have a marriage like the one that my parents sort of <laughs> perhaps were envisioning in the 1970s. Free Chatham House rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the older sort of uh, way that people would sort of envision, you know, where it was controversial for Catholics and Protestants to marry. Um, uh, that, that is not the vision that, um, that I have been fighting or working for. Um, but in terms of um, the, have, has it, have women contributed to the movement? Absolutely. They have been integral to the marriage equality movement and its success. Has that always been reflected in the media? I don't think it has been. So as I said, I have been very fortunate in that I think that the people that I have worked with who have had leadership roles have elevated and seen that as an issue. But I do believe if you did look at the contribution of women as it was reflected, um, and particularly I think the contribution of lesbian women, is that something that you would necessarily pick up on? And I don't know that it is. Over the last few decades, feminist activism has been challenged to integrate a wider range of perspectives and issues. Eva, what kind of changes have you witnessed in your lifetime of engaging in feminist activism? 
I think it's a hard one. I mean, one of the things I would like to address is the fact that people say 70s feminism was all about white, upper middle class women and didn't really deal with any of the other issues. And that's a lo load of bloody bullshit. It certainly it wasn't around in Sydney. <coughs> we were always very much engaged with various things. I mean, obviously, we had a, in, some engagement with the indigenous stuff with people like Pat O'Shane and various other people who were involved in it in an early stage. I can remember setting up a whole lot of stuff about migrant women because that was my background, you know, that I came from and the various other groups and things that were happening there. So there was a, a real attempt from a very new movement to try and be as inclusive as we could. And certainly the issues we picked up were not the issues about middle class thing. I mean, that whole issue about getting people into positions of power. I mean, we had the original idea, which was we were wrong, but we really haven't acknowledged it, that getting women into powerful positions would work because they'd actually fix things. We forgot that the only women they allowed to get in, they chucked us out fairly earlier for a while. We Briefly after the... It was interesting, during the Whitlam time, we had these things called Femocrats, where a lot of us got jobs in the public service, and I did very briefly too, but we, a lot of us lost them, lost them fairly quickly when they worked out we were actually there <laughs> to undermine the system, <laughs> not to support it. <laughs> and then, then they started appointing fem, you know, people into those jobs that were sort of good little public servants who were there to do the right thing. And that's what we forget is that you know, people get into those situations because they are not threatening the system. I kept saying people should stop reading Karl Marx and start reading Max Weber instead. If anybody else has got a sociological background, they'll know what we're talking about because Weber wrote some very interesting stuff in the 1890s, mainly based on the Prussian civil service, but he worked it all out, which basically said, you know, that uh, institutions have an infinite capacity to organize themselves so they get loyalty from the people within them and they oppose any attempts to change them. And that's something that I don't think we actually understood clearly enough. The other thing I don't think we understood is to go back to another male person, but he did actually marry Mary Wollstonecraft, so he's not too bad, which is William Godwin, who was a, uh, a philosopher with an anarchist background who also said as soon as you institutionalise something, you ossify it, which is something I think we also don't recognise, is that gr as people come together in groups, and that also applies sometimes to political groups, that we spend so much time talking about the structures and the voting capacities and, and the rules and the various other things, we forget what the fuck we were do, do, trying to do there in the first place. So there's a whole lot of issues, including the issue that I think you've raised about consensus politics. I'm not concerned, my concern about consensus politics is I've too often I've found out that consensus politics actually goes to the people who've got the longest stomach for staying at the meetings. Because if you last long enough, everybody else goes home and then you win. And I'm not sure that's more democratic <laughs> than actually getting a majority at an earlier stage. But I think that's why I put up that sort of thing about sort of having a, a sense of optimism without knowing what the solutions are. I think one of the problems is that we always, you know, that if we try and work through till we know what the answer is, and that's my problem with a large amount of people who are sort of post-Marxists of varying sorts, you know, we're getting the revolution. Yes, but what do we do afterwards? Don't mention it. So recently I've decided I'm a bit more of a Leninist than a Marxist in the terms of the fact that they drag Lenin back to tell them what to do after the revolution because Marx never really worked it out. So if any of you are putative Marxists, I hate to tell you he fucked up and he got his wife to do all the housework. But I think if you're looking at what the women's movement's done, I think what the women's movement did in the 1970s was have a very clear sense that we were there to change society. By the time the 80s turned up and we ended up with neoliberalism, I think a large number of the women's movement shifted from changing society to changing their bodies because it, society was too hard to change at that stage. So it was much easier to worry about what you looked like and the whole sort of physical t side of things. And feminism basically became fragmented. Some people joined, you know, the liberal feminists joined the, you know, the, 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 fem the liberal fights. And a lot of these sort of more radical feminists sort of somehow other faded into the sorts of distance and things like that. So at the moment, I don't think we can say what the women's movement's doing because I don't know who they are anymore in the sense that there's lots of small groups doing various things. We spend a lot of time arguing amongst ourselves. We spend a lot of time with the sort of issues, and I mean, I know the intersectionality stuff and I support it is very important, but I think it's got to be two sides to it, and I know this is a real problem because of the power of the, if you like, the white Anglo sort of dominant stuff, which I don't fit under very well either. Uh, is, a, is the thing there, but we actually need to start also looking at what we have in common as well as where we, where we differ because we need to work out ways of finding our communalities and acknowledging the importance of the differences with equal you know, strength and enthusiasm. And at the moment, 
it's very fragmented, and I just think we're not being very effective. We're not picking up things like the universal basic income, which would seem to be a sitter for the feminist, would pay us for all that unpaid work we do now, rather than demanding we go into the workforce full time in order to sort of fix our superannuation deficits. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff that we could be talking about now because things are fragmenting, and neoliberalism is crashing, but social democracy has disappeared, and I think we need social democracy because if we don't have social democracy, we don't have trust. Democracy is based on voters having a level of trust. I did some boy lectures in 1995 and talked about social capital and trust. They're online, called a truly civil society, illegally online, so you can download them. With <laughs> thing. Um, because, I was, you know, democracy is a trust process because if you don't trust other people, apart from the ones that look like you and talk like you, we have a problem. And if you don't trust the issues, you know, the states, the process of, of decision making, we destroy it. And that's when populism starts. That's when you get the sorts of things that you're getting now where people say, oh, oh if only we had a strong man, they'd fix it all. And I just think we need to be very wary of that because the more we fight amongst ourselves, the more we divide amongst ourselves and don't look at the overarching picture of how do we put ourselves back so that we're citizens in a society, not customers in an economy the more we're going to find the things that we have gained disappearing as they are at the moment. The Labour Party is still being sort of neoliberal light. They haven't actually got over their economic diseases. The Greens party, but I've argued this one for Christine for a <laughs> long time, have some excellent bits and pieces, but you can't find them because they're not actually anywhere that you can find them on the website because they're so democratic they won't actually put them together because that might offend the people that move the motion. <laughs> And I think there's <laughs> ways and means that you can find compromises in between that so that one can actually say, here is a narrative about the society we want to move into, which can deal with, I with the, neo uh, you know, with neo the damage of neoliberalism, which can deal with the environmental movement, which can deal with techn technical change, and all of the other things that we have to deal with, and create something where the feminized areas of relationships, ethics, emotions, all of those things that don't count, are called externalities in, in economics, where those things get reduced back to paying for things and we actually create the sort of civil society which gives us all a sense of agency, of both belonging and being able to be critics of it. And just as a, a last thing is, my heroine of this is also somebody not very popular around things, is Hannah Arendt, because basically what she said really counts for all of us and we have to remember it. She went to the Eichmann trial and took a look at, look at Eichmann and what, was, what the Nazis had did and said, what we have to remember is the banality of evil. Ordinary people do evil deeds because we are, desire far too often to become part of the mob. And I think that's what we're facing at the moment and I want feminism to rescue us from it. Thank you. So we're, we're getting towards uh, question time. So if, um, if you have a question, please start plotting it out in your brain and, and we'll have microphones, so please do wait for it so it can be properly recorded. I want to go to you, Winnie, and just ask, how important do you think the written word is to activism of, of all kinds and do you think people underestimate its power? Uh, definitely, as an intersectional feminist, people definitely um, underestimate the power that it means uh, for self-determined people, uh, for self-determined marginalised people to tell their own stories. I don't think there can be two sides uh, if there's no such thing as equality. And definitely for uh, marginalised groups, uh, especially uh, racial minorities, who do make up a lot of the majority of Australian society, um, our, our writing is often very undermined and our writing is often very much stolen um, and used to create very neatly packaged, very well marketed, version, um, very incomplete and often false versions um, of what uh, the stories of people of colour. Take for example Chris Lilly, a white guy grew up in Pimble, um, not at all related to any kind of uh, Pacifica communities uh, or people uh, decided one day that it would be a great research project to go into Western Sydney <laughs> uh, and go in and and go interview very young, uh, very uncritical uh, young Tongan men uh, and discuss and kind of research them like they were animals. Took a lot of videos, took a lot of notes, did a lot of interviews um, with them, uh, and then decided to use that information um, to 
go completely against them uh, and to completely vilify them on, on national TV and international TV. And so my job as the manager of Sweatshop Western Sydney Literacy Movement is to create that kind of self-determination because without equality, there can be no two sides. <laughs> the only two sides is the people in power and the ones who are, um, mm. who are being marginalised um, and, who, and who don't have any sense of agency. And so it's about those people who don't feel like they have a sense of agency um, to create that agency for themselves, to use their own voices, to tell their own stories. And that's the way that I found um, as, as a brown woman that change can happen is when we tell our own stories for ourselves and for our own communities and we don't let these voices coming in like Chris Lilly to determine who we are as people. Uh, and so definitely um, in my work at Sweatshop, I run uh, Sweatshop's first diverse women's writers collective, which is exclusively for indigenous and culturally and linguistically uh, diverse people who identify as women. And each one of them have learned the process of critical thinking uh, and to understand uh, their own story. As African American feminist and scholar Bell Hook said, uh, literacy determines how we see what we see. Mm -hmm. And the degrees of literacy is what I try to enact. And so the written word, uh, from an oral storytelling culture is very important to me because it brings together um, the fundamental and intersectional experiences of being uh, a mixed race Tongan Australian woman from Mount Druitt. And each member of that collective in the diverse women's uh, writers group that I run uh, once a month has had that opportunity to use their own voice where they haven't before. Thank you. Mm. Um, Christine, do you think that there is a different kind of social pushback against feminist activism as compared to other forms of activism? Uh, yes, so I just want to make a distinction to start with. Um, female, feminine uh, or female advocates uh, can be for the most destructive forces on the planet. Uh, so, in fact, if the oil industry needs to put a positive spin on something or the coal industry or the Business Council of Australia or the Chamber of Commerce, they will appoint a woman to be the spokesperson for that. Equally, in government, you will find, um, and in politics generally, women uh, who are in the political parties who are no more than just representing the very worst kind of exploitation of people and the planet uh, that you, you can find. Um, and those people, those women, rarely have pushback uh, on them because they are representing the status quo. They are representing the patriarchy, they are representing business as it currently stands, the law as it currently stands, politics as it currently stands, and so they are regarded as in the um, Finn reviews, you know, 50 most powerful women or, you know, somebody, well, you know, all of those uh, magazines, 50 most powerful women. Yes, they are because they are put there to uphold the power of the existing order. Mm. So when, when, and I want to make this uh, clear because when people talk about women in politics, um, there's a very, you know, I think there should be 50% women in politics because we're 50% of the human race. We deserve to have 50% of the representation. But that does not assume that just because you have 50% women in politics, you're going to have nicer, kinder, gen more generous, mm -hmm. more just, anything else. You are not. They are going to run exactly the same party line as their male colleagues and so on in the party. So the pushback that you get as a feminist activist is quite something by comparison. So you can have, and you will frequently have Q&A and the others set up two women on the platform, um, supposedly uh, because that makes them both uh, feminist activists who are coming from two different perspectives. Well, they're two women who are coming from two different perspectives. They're not two feminists who are coming from two different uh, perspectives. So I just think we need to get a bit more critical eye on the cynicism that's going on in the appointment of uh, these women into senior positions in the public service, in the banks, in the, um, in the resource-based industries and the like. So when you then, the other thing I'd uh, point out is that 
Um, men, and I mentioned this to Eva before because I find it interesting, men on the right of politics get behind women on the right of politics. So you will find men on the right supporting Pauline Hanson, uh, men on the right supporting uh, Sarah Palin and uh, Le Pen, for example, uh, all of those, because they are the um, a, a more um, acceptable, if you like, agreeable form of exactly what those men stand <laughs> for. Exactly. However, if you come to the left, advocist, uh, feminist advocates on the left, like I am, for example, are frequently not supported by men on the left. Now, why is that? Why is it that I could stand up and say something and be attacked by men on the left, whereas a woman like Hanson will stand up and the men on the right will think she's a hero, isn't she strong, isn't she great, isn't she marvellous? And so I think that comes to this sense of on the left of politics, and so you would put this in the area where you're trying to bring about change for justice, for women's rights, for um, family violence, for... Uh, racism, you know, you're trying to bring about significant societal change and you are not supported by many of the men on the left and that comes from, as Eva referred to a little earlier, to the Marxist background that a lot of those come from which is not a feminist perspective. So there is a different pushback even in on the issues on which you would expect to have the support of the left because you would expect that they would come from that, you are not going to get it because A, you're a woman and B, you're a feminist woman. So a woman is acceptable, a feminist woman, that is a different thing. Thank you. Because of that, women, uh, feminist activists um, have to deal with pushback. I wondered, Charlene, given some of the, the toxic nature of, of the campaign um, because of the plebiscite particularly. H on a personal level, how do you deal with, with the pushback that, that sort of does come into these conversations? Yeah, look, I, th I think that the, that the, 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 the thing, I think everyone here on the panel would agree that that what happened last year in terms of that public vote never should have occurred, and it did become incredibly personal and incredibly toxic. And I have no doubt that there are people we don't have with us because of it, and we also will live with the consequences of that for quite some time. So um, certainly that 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 made. Uh, everything incredibly personal for a lot of people. You know, there would have been uh, people across the country, and and uh, I can speak as a lesbian woman, but there would have been people from across the LGBTIQ spectrum who would have been forced to have conversations they didn't want to have, um, been put in terrible situations that they did not want to be put into because of because of last year. Does it become uh, particularly personal when you're advocating for a cause like this? Um, I think one of the best ways to advocate for social change is to share your personal story and that has always been, I think, one of the central parts of the campaign for marriage equality in this country, um, sharing the reasons why this matters. And uh, so, of course, you do have to put yourself out there to some extent and that does mean that you can get people saying pretty uh, awful and hurtful things about you, um, about your relationship and so on. Um, there was one time I remember when uh, the Sydney Morning Herald did, did some little article and they used a photo of Sarah and I who's sitting at the back and um, th it was all kind of nice, most of the comments were okay, but there was somebody who did say we should be beheaded. So, you know, it's hard to have a photo of yourself up there <laughs> and to read something like that. But I also do see that importance of uh, explaining on a personal level why a bigger social issue is important. So certainly on a personal level, yes, there's been pushback. And, you know, I think that there... Um, Australian society has gone on an enormous journey as far as uh, a lot of these issues are concerned, particularly, uh, as I said, I can speak as a, as a lesbian person, but I realise that there is a very long way to go for a lot of other parts of our community. And I, I think something that when we talk about resistance and the path forward for feminist activism, we, you know, Winnie talked a lot about the power and, and importance of solidarity and uh, intersectionality and certainly... I think that's something I'd really like to see as we move into the future, that we draw on the lessons of, 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 uh, of the past and, and really try to think about a shared vision where uh, everyone can live out their potential, where we do have a world where you're not held back by your sexuality, your gender identity, your class or your race. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to questions even though I have more. So if you want to raise your hands and then we have some uh, volunteers who will bring you a microphone. I think we have one up here. 
And um, if you don't mind, yeah, if, and so if we can share between just if the question sort of comes. So, uh, Does anyone want to start? Here we have a very straight hand up. <laughs> I'm sorry to start <coughs> with a comment. A very brief one. It is going to be a quick one, one but it's about question. activism and how we can carry it out as individuals. And it comes from the discussion around the yes debate last year. I read a story, I think it was on Facebook, where a young man had written a letter to all of the people in his street and said, I am a gay young man and I am asking you to consider what you're going to do when the plebiscite comes. And I'm telling you now that if you're going to vote yes, I say thank you. And if you're going, thinking about voting no, here's my email address. And you know I live at number 23, please come and see me. I thought that was a fantastic example of personal activism. I know small things, you know, can be, you know, implemented. But I did exactly the same thing as the mother of a gay young man. I took that example and I wrote that letter to all the people in my street. And for all of the struggle that the whole debate created for me as the mother of a gay young man and raised up within me a whole lot of pain and anguish about our journey, the joy of the three responses I got by email from three of the people in my street to say, yes, we are voting yes, and we are beside you and behind you, and in fact, we are with you, was just made all the difference. So it just was a, per as a lobbyist, that that's been my career, but it was the first time I'd seen such a very clever, incredibly personal, very simple campaign put into place and gave me such a really great reward. Uh, the power of those conversations is, is my mother and her partner held a street barbecue and um, as a result of that, they got to know other lesbian women on their street, <laughs> but one of which is going to be my neighbour. So <laughs> these things have beautiful ramifications. Did anyone want to comment in reply to the comment? Or should we move to the next one? Well, oh, just to say, it, everyone should do what they can. And that's basically, um, uh, it's sort of the 101 of activism. Everybody can be an activist or support other people who are activists and everybody can do something and so that's great. But we've reached a point where it has to be systemic. You know, we have reached the point on the environment particularly where um, the individual actions people take are important but we don't have enough time for that to permeate at the global level or even nationally. We have to have systemic, major systemic shifts. So we need activism at the local street community level but we also need to ratchet it up to do that and do something for the state election or do something for the federal election or whatever we just can't do one or the other because we've run out of time can i just add a little bit to that because i think one of the things that worries me is part of the pessimism if you like that's going around at the moment is a lot of people i know are involved in something which happens to be very local or very personal around their area and I'm trying to set up something where we actually set up a network of, of good social policies, all the stuff that the major parties are doing. And if anybody wants, I've got a few cards on that. But when I say things to people like, you know, are you interested in joining up on this bigger thing? They say, oh, no, I've got my local stuff. I've got to go on that one too. And I said, but, you know, what you're doing there wouldn't have to be done if that wasn't happening up there or there or this connects up with these things there. And the response I get, which is a response about sort of pessimism, is, yeah, but I haven't got any time, so I'm just not interested in that. But it just means that we've got lots of people being slightly overly possessive about what they're doing, but not recognising that what we need to do at the same time is connect it up so that we get some big picture stuff, because otherwise we're just going to get the areas where people do have a sense of agency and do something doing very well and the areas where people feel they have no sense of agency and they're being sat upon doing badly and we just increase the inequality. So we need to do, the, you know, do it across the spectrum so that we fix the causes of the issues that happen up there and the effects of it down at the local level. But we can't, do, we can't just do the, you know, plugging the effects at the bottom end unless we stop the stream that's coming out of the problem at the top end. Winnie or Charlene, did you have a comment in response to that one? 
no, I, I guess I just sort of lament that uh, there is a situation where people are sort of disconnecting from these broader issues because mm. as has sort of come through the panel, there is this lack of faith mm. that society and politicians have the ability to solve or even care about the problems mm. that they face. So there is this sort of withdrawal into the local and into sort of the, the more um, intimate sort of life. And I find that... Um, in some ways really concerning when we do talk about things like uh, you know global global environmental issues where we all need to be playing a really active part and I guess I'm just sort of wanted to say how how I find that really concerning and I wonder what the way forward is past that disillusionment and that discontent do you want to go to the next <laughs> question okay I think I saw someone yeah um, that leads quite perfectly into my question. Um, thank you all so much for your um, amazing um, thoughts and very inspiring conversations. And Winnie, I have to thank you in particular for helping me to understand why Chris Lilly has always made me so uncomfortable. Even just his dancing as a woman has made me uncomfortable and you just so perfectly um, deconstructed him. So thank you for that in particular. Um, but my question is um, specifically to Christine, but um, perhaps all of you have some thoughts, um, but going back to your um, point where you were talking about systemic change and talking about the changes to the public service and NGOs and the sort of, de well, the debilitation of them because they've been sort of shut down and, and turned into either political, you know, ministers things or just, you know, some professional organisations. And I'm just wondering, and because that to me seems a sort of another product of the ubiquitous neoliberalism of everything getting, you know, funding cut and everything. And, you know, I'm just thinking about me as a, you know, a citizen, how might someone like me address that enormously, you know, systemic problem that seems to be part of a global kind of economic paradigm? <laughs> just a small I, question. I mean, you know, is it about getting a kind of referendum, or, you know, advocating, you know, like getting a, you know, what do you call them where you sign the things? Um, you know, sorry, that's me. Yeah, petition. You know, uh, you know, for a citizen, how do you start to feed in? I mean, is it about talking to my local member or? Okay, so uh, let me just go with petitions for a start. Um, people, it's a bit like clicktivism too. People feel like they've done something if they've signed a petition or they've liked something or shared something, and it's true they have, and it has some value, but not much. So clicktivism is just the collective of the number. So uh, if you've got a million clicks on something, then um, somebody will take notice of it. If you, as a politician, I can tell you, as a member of parliament, if I got 50 letters and they were all the same, they were basically a rony-eyed letter signed by, and I just took virtually no notice of it. It was just, that was, but if I got a handwritten letter, that would make, that would be an entirely different thing or even a personal email as opposed to just your Ronio'd um, petition, automatic thing. But petitions, the way they're treated in parliaments is co with complete contempt. Yeah. They basically just stand up and say, we're going to table 10 petitions here about blah, 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 blah and blah. Bang, they're tabled, they go straight to the parliamentary library. At some point, somebody might look at them and <laughs> find out that there are 10 dead dogs on the first page or, you know, whatever else. Seriously, they are not... It's only the data that matters. So, you know, 100,000 people signed a petition for something in that area, well, that might actually influence the vote, so that might take a notice. But as to the detail and the thought that's gone into the specific matters, it, it, it doesn't come down to that level. But going to s making an appointment and going to see a member of parliament matters and you need to have good background on the issue and a solution to put forward and a question to say why not. Mm. So you can go in and say this is the situation, this is what I think we can do about it and this is what my community group or whoever thinks we can do about it. Why can't that be done? because there is no reason why it can't be done most of the time. It just is it hasn't been done. No one's actually looked at it. No one's actually thought about it. It's not a marginal seat. So that's the other thing. Um, they only care about what happens. The, the least looked after people in Australia are in safe seats on any side of politics. If you're in a safe seat, 
forget it. It's only if you're in a marginal that they will start really taking notice because that's where government will change or not in those 30 marginal seats or whatever they are around the country. But on issue, on, on big systemic issues like the public service, I encourage everyone in every conversation they have with people to just raise this issue. At the senior level, we do not have a public service anymore and it really matters in terms of policy development and the analysis that goes up to ministers. The, the whole mentality of plausible deniability is now really big in politics. So the minister can say, I wasn't told. Nobody drew that to my attention. And they don't even have to have a memo to the senior person to say, don't tell me. That person already knows uh, by virtue of the philosophy and whatever else not to. So there won't be a, even a trail, uh, an email trail or memo trail or anything. It'll just be the plausible deniability. So get involved and actually take some personal action of going and seeing somebody and starting that process. Because once you've sat in an office with someone, it makes a difference. And the second thing is ask them for something. Ask them to come and see it. It's, so if you've got an issue with pollution, if you've got an issue with safety, if you've got an issue with something in your area, you can say, and I'd like you to come with me to see this. And when can you? And so on. And force the issue. Uh, and if you've lost funding for a, a, a shelter or something like that, come and see what you are doing. Come and see it. Because it, it gives you more access and more time when the person comes to see that thing. But also, it's the physical reality of once you actually have seen something, it's pretty hard to stand up in the parliament and deny that it exists or the problem is there. Thank you. Can I pick up on some of that? I mean, I, I, all the things that have been said, I agree absolutely. I mean, forget it about petitions. It might make you feel better. But really, I mean, a, a petition about a very particular issue in a very particular area might, if you get enough signatures, do it. But frankly, people like Change Org and various other things, and unfortunately also get up to some degree, gives people a sense of the fact that they're doing something when actually it's having practically no effect in most cases. And if you take a look at the sort of record of those things is, you know, it's okay for getting somebody a, a grant, you know, to go and to have something done for their health maybe or something of that sort, but anything more complex. Back to the issue that I said earlier, you need to identify the loose bricks. Find out who your local member is. If you're in a marginal seat, that's a good thing. If you're not, find out one of your friends who's in a marginal seat. Go and talk to people in the marginal seat areas. Remember, the senators don't have marginal, non-marginal seats. Go and see them. Check up if you're going to see somebody who's in the Labour Party, which faction they belong to, because that counts also if you're talking to them. Get to know, particularly if there's ministers, get to know their, their staffers, because often finding action to a staffer is actually quite effective. And also give them something that needs a response. Yes. That's one reason I've got this sort of thing called the Good Society Network, where we're trying to put up policies. I've stuck a few up on the universal basic income and how to decommercialise childcare, because I think these are major sorts of issues at the moment, just as examples. But we've got a two-page sheet, which is actually similar to the cover of a, of a cabinet submission, which is a whole series of questions which I used to get asked when I was doing some work in the state public uh, with state politicians. Who benefits, who loses, who's going to support it, who's going to be against it, what's it going to cost and how long would it take you to do it? If you can give somebody these sorts of answers to those questions, that's what actually everything is. And no more than two pages. People wander in with submissions. They've got, you know, they don't even bother putting the, uh, the recommendations on the front of it. They think somebody's going to read them. They're not. Give them something that's one page, they might read it too, they might manage it, but no more than that. You, if you need backup, somebody from the staff might come back to you and say, have you got further data or something like that, if you've got something. But we've got to get to the point where you're actually intervening and standing outside yelling in slogans doesn't work. Go in and talk to them. You know, it's, there's a whole sort of thing there. And for heaven's sake, one thing that people always do is make sure you're talking to the right person. Because people go and talk to state politicians about the federal issues. They go to talk to federal politicians about state issues. They don't bother passing it on. They dump it in the waste paper basket. So don't assume it's going to do it. If you go to the wrong person, if you go and see the wrong minister about something, again, they're not going to necessarily pass it on unless you look as though you're important. So you've got to be very clear, very accurate. And if you get something wrong, put the wrong figures down on it, they immediately sort of negate everything else you've written. So you've got to be really clear about what you're doing. 
And in those cases, if you get a group of people, I mean, first of all, I'd say it's not just you. Talk to your friends, get a group together, give yourself a fancy title, get yourself a letterhead, you know, send things in, try and look at that thing. Individuals are not particularly good at things, but it's easy enough these days online to get yourself an identity and to start doing things, turn up at meetings. Particularly now we've got elections coming on. But it really is a case of, you know, don't join in any of these things. I mean, GetUp does have some advantages, but they don't have proper policies. They're a protest group primarily. And I've gone in and talked to them and said, why don't you actually have policies and options you can put up? They said, oh, it's up to people to work out their options. Same with the Centre for Australian Progress. There's practically nobody doing any good social policy around there at the moment because we've got this idea that if we create a mass movement, somehow the policies arise automatically from the mass movement, and they don't. Writing policy, and I'm sure Christine would support me because that's the reason when you say to people, what do you want me to do what about do it? Do? They look at you blankly, you know? So you've got to do that research, and some of us are doing it. I'm prepared to help with it. I used to teach it for things like that but you've got to have something which is going to actually get through to them. And certainly in the feminist area, there isn't anybody out there doing feminist policy at the moment, I hate to say this, but I can't think of a single organisation. There's some that are joining in and trying for the 440th time to get abortion through in New South Wales. But you know, there's a few people sort of fiddling around the edges of the Me Too and the other sorts of stuff, but they're looking at, at helping people to go and see lawyers who are going to fuck them up in the court system rather than trying to work out why men are doing this and how do we stop it. We're not looking at the big picture stuff, we're sort of doing the classic feminine stuff of rescuing the victims. And I think we've got to actually look at the social change. And I know that's not a popular viewpoint, but I just think we've got to actually look at how we change the views, what we change, what we do to men. It's no use putting the odd perpetrator in jail. Why do so many men do it? What happens about it? What do we do to little boys? that give them those sorts of anxieties. We need to start looking at big picture change, and I'm a big picture person. And the only other thing I would say on that, and I know this is not going to be popular, don't be critical of the women who are up front. Stop slagging off at Jermaine Greer. Stop you know, slagging off at me. You know, this idea that we should dump any woman if she is not the person, who, if she doesn't, if she says, I don't agree with you. We're not very good at dealing with tall poppies. We are actually highly critical of women who might be offending us by putting up something we don't agree with who has been a feminist. Stop it. You know, we are a diverse group of people and we need to sort of look at some of the things that we're doing and not just slag off at the things there because we do need to provide something which does show that we actually can disagree politely but we don't slag off at, at the women like myself who are motor mouths, who are prepared to push the issues. And unfortunately, we do that quite, women's groups actually do that quite often. I have some considerable evidence of that personally. Shirley or Winnie, did you have anything to add? Um, I guess I'd just say on that, um, you know, I, I think that there's, uh, the, you know, a bit, of, a bit of a saying or an approach that you never really, I don't think anyone's ever had their mind changed by having someone scream at them. Um, so, so I endorse that sentiment. Um, Jermaine Greer, I have very different uh, approach and uh, view on uh, the issue of uh, trans women, uh, but I agree that the way to the way to approach that is not to scream and to uh, personally attack people. You've always got to look at the ideas and engage in an ideas-based discourse, I think. Winnie, do you want to go to the next question or did you want to have a... Uh yeah, I think that um, when we're kind of talking about uh, these issues, it definitely is about big changes and it definitely is about looking at big pictures. Uh, but it's also remembering, remembering that a lot of people are forcibly silenced uh, and a lot of people don't actually have a platform uh, to talk. Uh, and there's a very real um, issue uh, where black and brown women are simply seen as angry and screaming for talking about issues uh, that personally affect them. Um, and so it definitely is about uh, remembering and, and, and making sure that there is space um, for marginalised voices to come to centre. Uh, and if that means that you s have to stop talking and you have to... Uh, be in the background for a little bit, you have to be comfortable with that. So sometimes there's room for actually amplifying other voices uh, in terms of really affecting change and, and obviously that's one of the key missions of Sweatshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And one hard lesson I had to learn because I do quite a lot of work around with Indigenous things, I'm attached to Indigenous things, is 
not to ask questions, just to sit down there and bloody listen. And that's something that I think a lot of us haven't been very good at. We have another question here from Rogan. Um, can I ask uh, what you were just saying about uh, people's minds not being changed by being screamed at? Um, that's, that seems a slightly uh, you know, a problematic statement for me in, in a feminist space because that is what women were told, you know, white women were told by men whenever, when they first started to, you know, agitate for their rights. Um, uh, to be nicer, to be more light, to act more like women should act. Mm -hmm. So um, th this idea that you know, if we you know disagree with Jermaine Greer or another uh, another feminist, that, that that we're just disagreeing with ideas and that we're screaming and we can't be polite about it, when in fact um, we might be you know arguing for our lives and arguing for, to be recognised uh, as people. Uh, it, it's quite. Um, Sometimes I, sorry, I know this is uh, not even a question, yeah. but but it kind of is a question because it's something I, I, I want like, you know, more 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 feminists uh, to think about because I I'm seeing the same sort of silencing replicated in feminist spaces that that is replicated that that is happening out there and I think that's what what Winnie was was trying yeah, um, to bring up so so. Uh, uh, um, so, uh, th this idea of these, these angry black and, and brown women, um, yeah, w sometimes we can just disagree and we're, we're cast as angry and aggressive, but sometimes we are <laughs> angry because we may be speaking for so long and not being heard and still being talked over, still being silenced and pushed aside. So it's only natural that we are going to have to raise our voice to try to, to, try to get heard. So, um, uh, to try to put a question on this is 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 do you do you see what we're trying to say here in in, mm. in that 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 we're not screaming we're actually just trying to to speak i was not being critical in that sort of sense and i agree with you completely that you have to do that sort of stuff and that you're entitled to yell and you're entitled to do it what i was objecting to is the sort of stuff that happens when somebody says Jermaine said she felt sorry for the bloke who's who things are i think she ought not to be ever called a feminist again you know, it's that sort of condemnation automatically that you've just said something that is seen as outside the accepted feminist rhetoric, so therefore you ought to do that. You know, I can remember being rung up by the media saying, should Jermaine Greer be excluded from feminism because she mentioned the fact that, uh, that uh, Julia Gillard had a big bum. You know, people get themselves into things like that and people carry on about it as though that's a serious way of trying to discipline people so that they say the right thing within feminism so in a sense I think I'm supporting you about the fact the thing but oh, very often it's that sort of thing particularly when you're seen as, a, as, a, as an upfront feminist that you're supposed to comply nicely with you know within the approved feminist frameworks and I'm not talking about people who are bloody angry about the fact that they've been excluded and left out and fail to be included and where people haven't listened and haven't given them a space that's something quite different but i am talking about the fact that you know that, that some feminists sort of feel that you know not you know that we ought to be able to criticize other women for being upfront feminists and saying something they don't agree with in a way which is quite anti and nasty and really doesn't help so i think you know, I agree with you, we shouldn't be silenced. I'm not very good at being silenced, as is perfectly bloody obvious. And I swear at people too. But I also got chucked out of a women's group at one stage because I swore at them. <laughs> so. Winnie, I just want to um, go back to you on that point. Do you think there's a difference between policing the boundaries of feminism, you know, saying people can't be defined as a feminist because of their view on X, versus, say, trying to open up the boundaries mm. of feminism or, or trying to open up the spaces allowed within feminism for a variety of voices but that sometimes that gets a bit muddied in mm. the conversation um yeah uh, as an intersectional feminist there's sometimes where I, I identify more with my race than i do my gender um, everything is very fluid and uh, everybody exists on a spectrum um, and so it's definitely when marginalized vo voices begin to talk uh, and, and we begin to discuss issues uh, that are about us and for us and for our communities, 
that's the way that the boundaries are open. It's not by talking to a person or a gatekeeper in power, uh, because simply because that the fact that they're in power, they might not very well be open to listening. Um, and I and I found that to be the case uh, in in a lot of my own personal experiences. Uh, Harmony Day, for example, in in high schools all across Australia every year. Um, I never did it. Uh, growing up, my nickname was Fia Balangi, which means wanting to be white. And so that's kind of a systemic issue of white supremacy in which I aspire to be white simply because society told me that that's what was beautiful uh, and that that's what was deemed humane. Uh, and so I remember the first day I got to do a cultural dance at my school. Um, and in Tongan culture, uh, we have a way of dancing where our bodies is covered in lolodonga and we're, we're in a dress and we're moving around. A, a lot of <laughs> white people see that as a very island fantasy, but it's very much part of my culture. And I just remember uh, my deputy principal, Mrs. Clay, who was a very um, strict white woman, uh, come up to me and my sister and my uh, other Samoan uh, friend uh, and tell us that um, our culture was inappropriate and shameful and that I had to hide that. Uh, and so the next year, the, the Pacifica students in my year were no longer allowed to participate in Harmony Day. And so that's the kind of systemic gatekeeping issues that I face all the time um, as an as a intersectional feminist who's trying to speak about uh, my intersection identities. So, and my, f my favorite feminist uh, scholar ever, Bell Hooks, um, had to change the tone of her voice to be accepted into institutions. She was seen as a very angry black woman who kept yelling about, about issues that, that were important to her. And the way that she had to change to be accepted was to make her voice sound like a mouse. Um, and so, that, that's just the method she had to push through to get to where she wanted to be. But I think now, don't worry about how gatekeepers see you. If I let Mrs. Clay tell me that my culture was shameful and that I was not allowed to participate it, um, in school, um, then I would still be a very self-hating uh, Uncle Tom <laughs> and, and I would still be called Fia Balangi and I would still think that uh, whiteness is what I had to aspire to. But because I just ignored Mrs. Clay and I left school <laughs> and I was very much uh, became grounded and critically conscious about my intersections as a, as a Tongan Australian woman. Um, who's Mrs. Clay now? I think we have time for a very brief question before I'm going to wrap it up. So down the front here. Um, I just wanted to thank Winnie for talking through her points because um, there's a lot of, um, as someone who completely went home one day after being teased and changed her voice to be Australian, um, it just resonates so much with me. And so I wanted to ask the panel, um, you know, in, in, I need help with the optimism side because we're still arguing that racism exists at the federal government level. So how can one have optimism in the, you know, living in this world that anything can change? Shailene, can we start with you? Um, sure. So I guess, you know, on, on the, um, you know, I think that uh, on the issue of race, um, you know, I, uh, I my mother was born in Fiji, but I am not identified as somebody who looks perhaps visibly uh, Fijian. Um, but I certainly had that experience of seeing the, the racism that she encountered and went through um, as somebody who did look very different in the Brisbane that I grew up in. And I think that, um, look, I would never, because, because of the fact that I uh, am, not, am not identified in that way by people immediately, I think that, um, you know, that is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, uh, it, but I think that... I think that it does it does mean that um, you know look I don't want to speak for people on what it is like to be uh, judged in this particular way. Um, I I have um, worked very closely recently on a campaign that drew very heavily from an indigenous contribution, and the way that the campaigners I worked with managed to maintain such optimism and positivity and hope, given that long history of oppression and um, you know the, the ongoing institutionalised endemic prejudice that Indigenous people still experience in this country, um, and the fact that they still had faith and were willing to help LGBTIQ people in a campaign for our rights uh, was probably one of the most inspiring things that I've ever seen. I can only, as a historian, and as I said, I, I, I can't speak for a direct lived experience for somebody who might who'd be very different to mine, but I believe ho through what I have seen that um, 
there is a movement for change. I have great faith in younger people. Um, you know, we have so, the fact that we can talk about somebody who is producing material that is giving a voice to people. You know, my, my grandmother who lives in Liverpool um, came to Australia. She can't read or write, yet uh, we have people like Winnie on the panel today who is working so hard to give a voice to people, uh, which, you know, th this sort of stuff, the, the more voices that we have that represent that diversity, that speak to who we are as a country, um, is the most powerful thing that I can see, and that does give me hope. The more that there is representation, the more that there is visibility and the, the more that there are people with the courage of yourself to share your story, we need it to come and share her story as well. Um, and, and that generational shift, uh, it does give me some, some cause for optimism and I hope that I am right. And I'm really sorry, but I, uh, we are actually out of time. So before we thank our panellists, um, I, I want to personally say thank you for such a great conversation. We could have gone for a few hours or a bit more and it's sort of the nature of these things. Um, I want to let you know there are tickets available to our Legacy Book session uh, this evening as our final panel. Um, I want to extend a huge thanks to all of the speakers that we've had throughout the festival and to the large team of volunteers that have worked to make this possible and to our director, Nikki Anderson. Um, I want to thank our generous uh, presenting partner, the UTS Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion and the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, there will be uh, book sales in the foyer from the Glee Books table, so please uh, make your way there after the speakers to have a, a look at there. And um, I want to thank every one of you for coming along and for being part of the session and for asking fabulous questions. Uh, but now could we please thank our speakers one more time. Thank you. Can we 